I have a uh, question to ask. How many of you, oh, let's give yourselves from a timeline four years back. How many of you have grown spiritually? Just give me a nod if you have and a hands up. Praise God. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. That's a powerful thing uh, to be able to, to answer that question that way. And I've, uh, over the you know, few decades I've walked with the Lord, have asked myself that question, uh, not so much directly, but more sensory, you know, and typically it would be like if I was going through a storm and I felt like, gosh, I should be beyond this right now. Um, well, I really haven't grown. It's like the same old thing keeps happening and I get into this, you know, self-sabotage uh, type of thing. Um, it would happen spiritually, but then I would also see signs of it naturally. Typically, it was something that would happen in the natural realm, like uh, something quite simple. Um, a, a physical ding, if you will. Um, I know all of you have had one before, like, right, like pulling a hamstring or something. It's like, oh, I knew I should have warmed up before I tried to run that four-second 40-yard dash. Never did a four second 40 yard dash, but I have tried to sprint before, <laughs> totally cold, and not having been in a place where I've been working out. And this familiar pop would happen. Ah, oh, and I, sh I, sh I, I knew better. And now, um, in that way, I physically uh, I, and spiritually, um, I'm, I'm embracing the fact that I am, I am growing uh, in those areas. And so I'm happy that you answered that question that I asked, I think it's important that you remember in this moment that answer because there will be things that come up where the answer to that question that yes, you have grown spiritually will really be a point of progress in the midst of some form of pressure or storm. Last uh, week, the Lord had me minister about one particular, uh, one particular ground of the four grounds in the parable of the sower, uh, thorny ground specifically. And I kind of want to pick up from that, from that point. We know that, um, you know, fear is what the enemy uses. Faith is what God uses. Uh, it's a force that he is behind, where fear is a force that the enemy is behind. And I've said it so many times before where uh, it helped me to understand only one of two things is going on as it pertains to any particular thing in my life. It's either under that umbrella of, of fear or under the umbrella of, of the force of, of the Lord, which is faith. And it kind of helped me because I can count to two real easy. I like to kind of put things, you know, if I could put it in two buckets, it's a little easier for me as opposed to, well, it could be these 10 things or these 10 things. It's like, ah, confusion comes in. And the reason I'm sharing this is because it, I, I think those are really good, um, it's really good, a really good place to be to kind of figure out where you want to progress to when something is going on. And often when things are really good and things are kind of flowing, we don't really... At least I don't really, you know, take account of all this bad stuff that's going on. It's like, man, things are really going good, you know, and you don't really have pressure. You're just like you're thankful, you're joyful, you're peaceful. It's, it's usually it's the other side of that where you kind of start going, what's going on with this situation? And that's the time to know because typically we're having those feelings because something has happened that we can see, touch, hear, you know, it's, it's, it's alive. I mean, it's actually a very tangible thing that creates this, this force. And then we begin to process it. And this tangible negative thing can get us to operate under that spirit of fear. Uh, and that spirit of fear can manifest a, uh, a, a really a thorny thing in our life, really poke at us when we focus on it. And this is why the Lord was, sh was sharing with us through Scripture and last week about these thorns of anxiety and what it is that we do. I'm just going to kind of recap very quickly in Mark chapter 4, Jesus shares a parable with disciples and many people that were around. He reads the parable of the sower. 
And then he reads it in, he, he shares it in, in, uh, in a parable form, meaning he takes a natural thing like seeds and ground that people could relate to, but there's a spiritual meaning behind it. But when he said this, the disciples didn't know exactly what it, what it was that he was saying. And so the scripture says after he had, after he had said this, uh, the scripture, they, uh, verse 10 says, but when he was alone, after he had shared this, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parable. Today's message is just quite simply, ask. Ask. I want you to think about that. Most of you, you heard me ask a question. Most of you have asked a question. Sometimes we ask ourselves stuff and just ask. We have a definition of what, what that means, ask. And I, I want to... I want to just be able to build upon that. And these disciples and, and those that were around asked Jesus after he shared this parable of the sower, what does that mean? What does that mean? Now, none of you, I'm sure, have done what I'm about to share. I've read scripture, and I was like, sometimes almost like Charlie Brown. <laughs> I could hear myself reading it. <laughs> My mind would go somewhere else. <laughs> then I reflect on the tones of my voice after I read it. And it sounded like, wah, 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 wah. No, whoa, whoa, get serious. This is God's word, right? So I'd get in there and I'd read the scripture. And then I'm like, nothing happened. <laughs> it's like, I kind of know what I'm reading and I know the words. But I'm like, then I'll go, oh, man, I almost don't even want to ask the Lord what that means. I should know what that means. You should know better. Now, I've asked myself this and gone through this type of process as, as being a minister of God. Um, you know, early on, before I was just sort of walking things out as a child of God, you know, and I get it. But then when I became like, you know, started listening to this call to teach the word, I was like, how could you teach out of this love letter from God in the majority of it you don't even know? And some of you haven't even read. Woo. So again, you know, faith, the force that God wants us to use and fear. And fear is, is always, quite simply, lack. Let me, let me give you an example if the devil's trying to have his way uh, in your life and you can decide, you can, you can have an indicator if, if he's trying to attack on you. Um, three Ds. Doubt, division, deception. So if you have thoughts of doubt, or there's something divisive or deception. What's deception? Well, it looks like it's okay, but it's not. So doubt is one that the enemy really tries to use, especially if you're a believer in God because he wants to create natural things, the enemy, to cause you to doubt that God can change that in your life. To doubt that God could do something for you. And if you begin to operate in doubt, all of a sudden it's like, wow, this is, this is pretty monumental and it looks pretty real, this, these things that would cause you to doubt. And as you focus on them, they can start to become like this, this thorn to kind of poke on you. And this thorn is really sort of this terrible fruit of anxiety. Anxiety. And so as Jesus described, began to describe the parable of the sower, he, he shared this. He said, to you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. So they asked him, Lord, what does this parable mean? And this is how he answered. To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. So that Greek word, it, it really describes... Uh, you know, it, the mystery. It's, it's something that is there that there's an answer to, but requires a little bit more, you know, a little bit more revealing, if you will. So what was powerful is that they asked him this question. We don't know what that means. And he said, well, good news to you. The mystery of what this, how this is and how God works has been given to you. I, 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 I've shared before that, the mystery of the gospel is not, you know, and the mystery of God as it pertains, it's not hidden from you. 
but for you. Remember Scooby-Doo? <laughs> you know, remember, remember at the end of, the, end of all Scooby-Doo episodes, you get, you know, the guy that takes off his mask and he's like, if it wasn't for those meddling kids, they would have got away, right? Mystery <laughs> solved. Mystery solved. Now, as an adult, I can watch Scooby-Doo and I can kind of figure it out, you know, who, 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 the, you know, who the bad guy is, so to speak. But as a child, I was like, oh, you know, it's the old who done it, but at the end, mystery solved. And they just kept after it, you know, the Scooby Doo crew. They just stayed after it. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been that cartoon. Life is kind of like that Scooby Doo or Scooby Don't. <laughs> and see, if you don't just try to figure out what these, what you, if you know that there's anxiety in your life, that the, then the enemy is present. So if it's, if it's, it's like, gosh, this thing keeps giving me anxiety. Sometimes we can ignore it, and it won't last forever how, how that little thorn pokes you. But it's there. And if it's a reoccurring thing, that means that there's, there's this stronghold that the enemy wants to have on you. And so this God has this, this way, this mystery, it's hidden for you. Meaning if you go after it and you figure it out and you unlock that treasure box of what he says, that fear or thorn of anxiety can be removed. And so quite often, sometimes people say, well, Paul said it this way, Lord, he talked about the thorn in the flesh. And this is one of the scriptures that people were like, well, you know, sometimes you just got to deal with this thorn in your flesh. God, Peter, you know, Paul asked uh, uh, the Lord three times to remove this from me. And the Lord's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. Well, what was the thorn? Really, it was a heckler. Sometimes people think, well, was it an actual, you know, read it. And it said, Satan had sent a messenger and he just was on Paul. Wherever Paul went, he was there. Always remind me of that. That movie, Happy Gilmore, it's another great one. You ever watch it? <laughs> kind of funny, right? You know, Happy's there trying to put his short game and the guys that are heckling, you know, in the background, it's all quiet like golf games should be. And he, ah, right before he hits the ball, he just, and this is what this, this messenger of Satan was. And this is how, what happens oftentimes. The enemy with thoughts based on fears that, that we might have will remind you of that in the very moment that you're supposed to do something, you know, to send the ball home, so to speak. This, this is where it happens, right? Most of you have probably been engaged in some form of sports. Typically, you, you know, you don't just start in and go to a game and play, right? You, you go through what? Practice, and practice, and practice. Even there's a little bit of nerves at practice, but pretty soon it's like, hey, you know, you guys can, you know, with your, with your, with your, you know, fellow sportsters, if you will, you, you know, you can talk and create a relationship. But then on game day, you're actually engaging in an activity with somebody else who's practiced, but you don't know them. And all of a sudden, this energy happens and you get on the field together. And all that you practice, you start to wonder, am I going to be able to perform like I did? Right. You know, think about uh, field goal kickers in football. Uh, I had a couple friends that, that were field goal kickers, and I would always remember I'd like in practice, they would just, we'd be out there doing all these other drills, and they'd just be standing there kicking the ball through the post, like, wow, anybody could do that, <laughs> right? But what you don't know about the kicker is the fact that he is all alone when that game is going. Can you imagine what he's doing? And then the other team, right before he goes to swing his leg back, time out, they're going to ice that guy, right? Get him to think about, can you make it? Can you make it? And there are chip shot distances for some people, but it's in the pressure of the game that a thorn of anxiety can get to you. And if you meditated on it long enough, you will stiffen up in your mental and physical performance outside of what you practiced when you were in the flow and you were just knocking 50 yarders through. This is what happens, these thorns of anxiety that can come in. And so Jesus, Jesus shared this about the foregrounds. He answered, said, to, to you, the mystery can be known. Then he goes on, he says, do you not understand this parable? He goes on to explain the four different types of ground. The wayside, which is literally means road. The stony ground. Then it says, among thorns. And then it says, the good ground. 
So the roadside stuff is pretty simple. When God, Jesus described the sower is him. The sower sows the word. Jesus is the word, it says in John chapter 1. So there's a message from God that can change things in the world through us. And Jesus lived this example for us. And he said, the word of God can change things. But sometimes the word goes out to people and hits their heart. And it's just like throwing seed on pavement. It's like immediately the birds of the air can just come and take it away. This just doesn't even have a chance to grow. And then there's this stony ground. And where there's gravel, usually there's a little bit of soil, but it's not enough to really support it. And, and for a short time, that, gra- that, that seed can sprout up and, and grow. And so what will happen is when outside pressure, the sun is used, as Jesus describes this, as the sun scorches on this thing, those roots aren't deep enough in this, this stony ground. And therefore, it just withers up. This is the word of God. The answer to prayers are people that want, right? So sometimes people want something and God has an answer for it and they don't even know. And it's just like the word is already sown. That's like what the Bible is. And, and be, it never has a chance because they, people don't, they don't know what God says and it's just gone. And then sometimes like, I heard that. That's, that's pretty good. And it'll kind of spring up. Yeah, that makes sense. But as soon as pressure comes, boom, it, 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 it just withers away that word that could change your life. And then the thorny ground, and this is where I describe that this is where most people, most Christians reside, the thorny ground. And this, this is why. Basically, if you can imagine a field of thorns already grown up, thistles, weeds, all this type of stuff, that a good word or the answer to what you've been praying for is, in, is spoken it goes into that big field of thorns that are grown up, and it goes down, it hits the ground, but what already exists, the fears, the anxieties, and all that type of stuff is too big, and it chokes out the word that was sown, and the word can't bear any fruit. And so this word in, in, our, in verse 19, the, the scripture says it this way. Now, these are the ones that are sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, and then it says, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Now, I want you to think about this word desires, the desires for other things. When we really want an answer from God, we really want some of these anxieties to come out of our life. Uh, This scripture is saying, desires for other things entering in choke out the answer to what we want. It's a good place to have knowledge of that. Then what do you do at that point? And so this is where I want to pick up in Philippians 4. It says, the word of God says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There's a lot there to unpack. It's quite simply this, recognizing that there's anxieties in our life, knowing that we are not to operate in that by thinking on it and focusing on it, but to cast that onto the Lord. And how do we do that? We Quit existing in anxiety. That's what it says. Be anxious for nothing. So don't in, exist in anxiety. Go back to the kicker. I've watched some guys that, that I knew had just, in, in just some average games, they hit some long field goals, short field goals. They had this sweet spot where it's almost like a given. People would be shocked. If everybody did their job and that ball got put in the right place, that guy was kicking it through. But at the end of the season, When you're really, you know, you've built up and maybe you have a really great record and all of a sudden these teams that come together that have really great records, pretty even skill sets, now this battle ensues. It's a whole different type of pressure when it comes down to three points could win the game for you. And that person that's like all season long has made this short distance, whatever that might be, and he gets up there, the pressure is greater. The ability to do what they've always done exists, but you cannot get frozen in your mind. And this is what the enemy wants, fear of failing, fear of failing, 
fear of failing. Did I even make those before? Yeah, I did, but it doesn't feel like it in the moment. And it takes discipline of heart to be able to go through and go just relax and focus and do. And you're going to feel the tingling and the anxiety and the pressure. But in this moment, this is where it said, Lord, I thank you. I am not going to exist in anxiety and meditate on the thoughts of failing, but what you can do. And as you point your mind towards that, this is what that means. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Request. Request. In Philippians there, that word, it, it's a Greek word, itama, itama. And it comes from this root word, iteo. And this is what I wanted to share with you today about asking. I have asked things of the Lord and not had them come to pass. Devil has fun with that, right? Because then he's like, see? And you're like, ooh, you get put that in the breadcrumb trail of your walk with the Lord. And then you ask him some others and you just don't see it come to pass. The devil's like, see? Am I alone in this? Yeah. This is why this is important. Well, then you kind of, well, if it's God's will, if it be God's will, sometimes he closes doors. The scripture doesn't talk about God closing doors. He says, ask, seek, knock. When you knock, it will be opened. But then you've asked, and then it doesn't happen. I guess that's a closed door. I haven't got to the, to the, to the, to the, to, to the, to the door that's open. It's going to give me this answer. It's just like, but it's so powerful how Jesus said that. Ask, seek, knock. And what I want to talk to you a little bit about today is the word ask. What I want to share with you a little bit about it is that A-S-K, that word, is, it's, it's in our, it's in the New Testament. And I started off in, in the book of Mark when the disciples ask Jesus. And there's a difference between that word ask and and how they were doing it versus when Jesus said to ask and it will be given to you. And it's spelled the same way, but they come from two very different roots. And this is what I want to share with you. I pray tell that it's something that will change your life. So, Again, when the disciples asked him, the 12 and those who were around and asked him about the parable, that word ask there is eratao. And as I shared in Philippians, that root, iteo, they sound somewhat familiar, but they're both translated to the English word ask. And when the disciples were asking Jesus is because they didn't know what was going on. What, what does that mean? But when Jesus said, ask, it will be given to you, it was, it's completely different. Because you can ask for a million dollars. You could ask for, take this sickness from me. You could ask for those, and then they, they don't happen. And you're like, well, I asked. What's the difference? And this, is what, this is what I really want to really spend some, some time. And quite, quite simply, the word ask as it as it uh, pertains to when the disciples asked Jesus, again, that Greek word, eratao, it means to ask a question, simply to ask. It's informational. I need information. You've said something. I need a little more information so that I understand. This is, this is how I typically think about ask. But there's, there's another word, Jesus actually used this, this word ask or the, this word uh, eratao in Matthew 16. And it says that Jesus asked his disciples, again, that word asked, who do men say that I am? He was seeking information from them. He knew who he was, but he was seeking information from the disciples. Who do men say that I am? So he used that word. I need some information from you. And they they responded. So Jesus used this, this word that he needed information, but the Son of God was all knowing. But oftentimes when he asks questions, it's really to draw out. He already knew. You know, and so this was so powerful because when he asked, 
he asked us, who do men say that I am? He got several answers. Some say you're a prophet, you're a teacher. Some say you're Elijah. But Peter answered the question differently. He said, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. This was powerful because this answer came from in here. It didn't come from, so when Jesus asked this question informationally, the first responses were just that. Oh, who do people say that he is? So they just went to that. This is, these people are saying you're this, and these people are saying you're that. And then he asked a different question. Who do you say that I am? And the answer came from Peter's heart, something he knew. So the answer came from a place of revelation, not just information about what other people said. This is exactly where your walk can continue to grow is that knowing that when you ask out of revelation from God based on his word, the answers start to come. So how do we get there? First, don't be fearful like it says in Philippians. Don't be anxious. Don't be focusing on these things. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request or ask to ask God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts. That sounds so good, but when this form of asking God, this supplication and this request, it's saying something different. You need to ask from a place of where you know, where you know, not where you have knowledge, but where you know in your heart what God wants. That when you start asking him based on this word, then you know. And when it comes from that place, then you're linked up you're hooked up. It's like you got traction to get somewhere. Jesus said in John 15, this is the Amplified. I love this. It says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is, if we are vitally united and my message lives in your heart, ask whatever you will and it will be done for you. That word ask comes from that revelational ask of God, comes from a place that you know. And Jesus says, this is why he opened up saying, if I abide in you and you and me, that means what I say lives inside of you. You're going to ask of, of me because you know of me. And when you ask from that position, it's going to be given to you. Healing. There are some things I'm believing for right now in my physical body that have not happened yet. But I am patient, meaning I'm unwavered. I'm, I'm not going to move from my position. These are some things that, like, for years that I've been believing for. But I know God can do it. And I, I'm just not, not going to waver off his word. But every day I have physical signs that say the contrary. Amen. I'm, I'm just going to keep staying steadfast in my faith. I'm not going to try to come up, well, it hasn't happened because of this, that. I'm just, I have to, I have, I'm just staying steadfast. The reason I am is because there are times where I have literally had physical symptoms come over my body and because I study God's word and I believe that 2,000 years ago that by his stripes I was healed. And at first I read that word and I'm like, wow, this is what God says about sickness and symptoms. Psalm 91 says that no disease, no plague can come near me. Why? Because I abide in the shelter of the almighty God. And I've read that before. <clears throat> having symptoms, you know, this being years ago and going, mm, but some people get sick. I see it all the time and I'm just one of them. But when I really begin to marinate on that and like, no, this doesn't belong to me, that Jesus was enough for this and that by faith, I really had to stretch. And what did I do by faith? Well, by his stripes, I am healed. And so I began to start ministering uh, to myself by saying the word in faith in the midst of st a storm of sickness. I'm going to give you an example. Uh, I don't remember exactly how long we've been in this building. Ten years? It's a decade. 
prior to, to us coming into this, God directed us here. And we used to be more in a public building. It was actually a, you know, a, it's called the Downtown Athletic Club. It's down here in Eugene. And, you know, they have court sports stuff there and swimming. They got a restaurant upstairs. And we would rent a little room. It was wonderful. But, man, I, I've shared this before, but I, I can think about that. Like, walking in on, in your Sunday best and you got a Bible and there's a guy, you know, with a rainbow headband and, you know, short shorts and he just got done playing racquetball and he's looking at you going by and we're pulling in our our you know, our choir, which is a little suitcase. It's got a CD player inside of it. That was our worship team back then, you know. And we're walking in, and there's people walking by full on sweat, like they just got done working out, you know. And then we would go upstairs, and we'd sit in this, you know, it was a nice, clean room, but at the podium, it, you know, we'd put an 11 by 8 sheet of paper over the top and behind it, you know, because the paper was sort of transparent. You could see that the sign, it said Downtown Athletic Club. But on the paper, it said Safe Haven. Boy, we were, right? And... <laughs> So we were like, gosh, we just, we want to get out of this place. And we were really believing and God led us here. And the reason I'm sharing this is because I remember at that point, it was like, it felt like we were, we were like coming into more of an, a, had an official place to come and worship. But I had f- a physical uh, sickness that was going on at that point. I was lit- I went to specialists and they, they diagnosed me with a disease called Meniere's disease. And it was an inner ear issue. And it began to really plague my life. Like I would be fine one day and five minutes later, all of a sudden things would start to shift in my vision and I would just be vomiting and could not even physically stand in any position. And I remember what God's word said and prior to that point I had you know, spoken against symptoms of coughs and, and flus and all that stuff. And I, I just would read the word and I'd just smile. And I said, you know, usually is when symptoms would come on. I was just like, wow, Jesus, thank you that by your stripes I am healed. And I would literally have symptoms going on. And I would, I would just thank the Lord. And sometimes it would go immediately. Other times it would be like maybe a half a day or a day, but I just, I just would not have stuff on me. Well, when this bigger thing, this disease that was diagnosed by a specialist came on and I had signs that would basically just render me completely inoperable. And the reason I'm sharing this is that the very first service that we were supposed to have here and we had, you know, some, some guests come in and my, my sister and it was just like this, we were excited that very night, I had a massive attack. Early in the morning, I, I, I was just, just a little after midnight, if I remember correctly, I had one of these, these um, equilibrium attacks from this disease that was diagnosed. And when they diagnosed that, by the way, by faith, it was kind of a small voice, but I was like, the, you know, I remember the doctors going, you have this. I'm like, mm, no, I don't. And they were like, yeah, this is, li- I mean, here's, here's all the signs that you have this. And by the way, this is why you came to us because you are having these attacks that render you inoperable like at any moment. Like I'd think, is this gonna happen when I drive? Is this gonna happen when I'm working? Is this gonna, I mean, it just, there was no, it just would happen. And so that, that night, the very first day I was supposed to come up and minister for something we were believing in, I had a massive attack. And I remember I was just praising the Lord over the porcelain, <laughs> stool that night literally just to I I couldn't even move and the things were spinning so bad I just and I was just like I I, I don't I want to gross you out I mean it wasn't like there was not a lot that was coming up it was just these dry heaves but I just could not even I couldn't even stay upright for hours and I'm I'm thinking (laughs) I got to get up there's no way it's like you know calling in sick Everything was built. I was just like, who am I going to call in sick to? (laughs) I I mean, I was the point guy, (laughs) you know? Hey, guys, just figure it out. Just get there and shake, you know. Who would I even call to? Well, the Lord, not my boss. He's the one that I served. And all night through the midst of this attack, I just remember just thanking the Lord. I would just like have a dry heave. And I just like, it it didn't come out like I could say it now. Thank you, Lord. It was more like, I mean, just the... All night. And finally, when the sun rose, that broke off me. And I vividly remember just sitting in one space between my dining room and this little, you know, place where I have kind of my prayer room. I was just sitting there. And all of a sudden, it started to leave. And boom, it was fine. 
And I came up and I was woozy, but I was so grateful that I stood on God's word and that attack left. Now, after that point, I really dug in and I really began to seek the Lord by wisdom of what I should be taking into my body, but I just started to believe him that this is going to be gone. And I'm standing here today completely healed of Meniere's disease. And it's something they say that can, cannot be done, could not be done. But I know that there's other people out there that have asked for things from God, and it still hasn't happened. And it doesn't mean that God's not answering. It just means that often we're asking based on knowledge that he can do something and not a position of revelation because we've digested what he said about that thing. So why am I, what am I sharing? Whatever issue that you have in your life that is bearing a thorn of anxiety, find a promise of God that pertains to that and rest in it. What do I mean by rest in it? Meditate in it. Read it. Get your eyes on it. Let your ears hear yourself saying this promise that deals with that thing that's going on in your life. I will get through this. With man, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. And this is when Jesus said, when, you, when my word abides in you, and then you ask, you're asking from a place of revelation. And the, he said, ask, and it'll be given. You seek it, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened. Why? Because you're asking not from information and knowledge of what God can do, but from revelation that it applies to you and that it's your promise. And when you get into that position, the, the, the power of God can start flowing through you. And why? So that you can share this with other people. This is so, so important about this, this ask. The Bible says, you know, as I read in 419, the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. That word desires actually has the same uh, word in its definition that the word ask from a place of revelation, ateo, it says crave. Crave of other things entering in, choke the word out. Crave when you ask God and he will give it to you. That same word, the same word is used to describe that word ask. It's, you crave something. So I just described that I crave to be healed. I crave just to take a normal drive and not be in fear that this thing would hit me. I really wanted that to happen. And, but there are times where when we crave other things, and what are other things? They're not necessarily evil. They're really just going, well, I could do more things with, with my life. And so it's so interesting uh, the devil will deceive you into thinking that you can walk with God, but really, you know, you don't have to go to church. You can just check in here and there. Um, you can, you know, you can love the Lord and, and you're saved. There's so many saved people going. But, but scripture talks about Paul wrote to the church and he said, by now, you should be teachers. But you need the milk of the word now. You started off so good. What happened? And they begin to crave or desire other things. They, they begin to give themselves over to other things and not, not the Lord. And so this deception is, is if you really follow God, you're going to have to give up a lot of stuff, right? Some people, they're like, oh, I don't know about serving because that means I have to get in front of people. And I don't like getting in front of people. Well, that means that I can't just come in and leave and, you know, I can just check in and check out. It's, this is different, you know. My brother, Matt, I, I have an appreciation for what you do. We get to work out with each other every once in a while in the morning. But when you're teaching, it's a different responsibility than just going in and working out, right? You're getting in there before anybody else does. You're writing down the workout. You're thinking, yep, there's a curriculum and how we teach, but you have a very specific way that you do it that really, really resonates, at least with me. I don't think anybody else, because they all tell me, this, no, I'm just totally messing. <laughs> but, but it really resonates how you teach. But you, you've gotten yourself to a point where you're coming in and you're preparing before people get there. And then after they leave, you're also doing something different. Yeah, people clean up, but you're making sure everything's in order. The doors are locked. Everything's right back to where when somebody comes in, they're just moving again. There's a different a different responsibility that is such an honor when you're serving the Lord that when you do a little bit more and you serve him, the benefits that come are far greater than just being able to check in and check out. And this is, this is that place where you're just like, 
I want to crave more. This is why Jesus said it this way. He was talking to believers. He said, wide. He's, first he said, enter the narrow gate. Tells you what you should do. Doesn't tell you you have to do it. He just tells you this is what you ought to do. He says, enter in by the narrow gate because wide is the gate and broad is the road to destruction. And many go in by it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way and there are few that find it, but it leads to life. Now, when you think about that, do you want an easy way, the path of least resistance, or do you want a hard way? Well, I'm telling you, with God, it's not hard, because when you have his word, he's giving you the answers to navigate through each step. Amen. And, and when you get to this point of, like, you know what you want, but you don't know how to get it, then you come to a place where you know that God can give it, but you're asking it's not happening, all that means is you have opportunity to really unfold the mystery and find a promise of God that pertains to the issue that you're having and rest in it. He can do it. He can heal me. He can provide for you physically, spiritually, financially. God can do it. There's an answer. There's so many promises in this word. All you got to do is find one that pertains to what your issue is and really, really just, just take it in, take it in, take it in. And, and once you do that, this power of God and this power of asking from a place of revelation will really start to well up and those things will happen. The, the, the Bible says that when Jesus spoke to the fig tree, he saw from afar and he was hungry that it had leaves on it. So he went up to it to eat. But when he saw it, it was like the tree was deceiving him. It had leaves, but it wasn't, it wasn't in season. And so he spoke to it and he said, let no man eat from you henceforth. And he walked away, and the disciples heard it. And they probably thought, why is he speaking to trees, right? He goes on about his business, ministers all day. They go home. The next morning, they come back, and as they're walking by, the disciples go, teacher, the tree that you spoke to, it's withered up and dead. And I'm talking, this isn't a little bramble bush. This was something significantly big in stature. It was like, obvious. It wasn't like, oh, well, it's just a little withered because it was cold last night. I'm talking, this was a full-on tree that it was just like, yesterday it was alive and today it is not. And so then Jesus's response was, have faith in God. And this is what, what the Lord is trying to, to share with us. He says, have faith in God. He says, for assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, and this is that word, eteo, meaning when you're asking out of a position of revelation because you know God's promise can manifest in your life because you've prayed on it. He says, when you ask with that heart, when you pray, believe that you receive it and you will have it. It's so wonderful. God is a God, it says in Romans 17, who calls those things which do not exist as though they did. We already know that in, if you read Genesis, you kind of start seeing in verse, you can't even get a few verses in, and he says, God's spirit hovered over the earth, and it was without form and void, and it was dark. So there was darkness that was apparent, but God spoke light. The reason I want to share this is that God doesn't wait for circumstances to line up before he speaks. He causes them to line up because he speaks. Amen. So when you have this anxiety thorn poking in you, you don't have to wait for those to get lined up and right and then praise God. You praise God what his word says and it'll change those circumstances. That's what it means. So when you start to get this full revelation of this word, ask, not just for information, but from revelation, and it comes through our efforts. I'll finish with this. I was going through some uh, emails yesterday, um, and they were from years ago. I think it was like four, four years ago, sometime like 2018. Two, uh, two, two people that I, that I had counseled uh, through, through email, and we had some, some meetings. Um, those two people are, they're alive, they're well today, uh, you know, God has blessed them in so many ways, and, and they've grown in so many ways. I want to share a difference uh, with these two people. One of them was very, they heard the word that the Lord had me share, and just quite simply, it was like, that's, that's a lot. That, that's, 
that's a lot to digest. I mean, can't God bless me if I don't really go to church? I mean, um, if I don't have to do all the things, I mean, if I don't, gosh, I feel like if I go, then I'm going to have to go all the time. And then, you know, and, and this is, I went back and I read this and I was like, wow, I, I can relate to that because I remember having those thoughts. And the other person uh, had been believing for years, literally, for the Lord to take this thorn from them. And it had to do with, you know, uh, it was, it was a, uh, a form of, of abuse of a substance. And just a legal substance, just something that had a, a hold on them. And they were like, you know, they're trusting God for that. And they had been asking for years and it hadn't been taken away from them. And they counseled with me and I shared what the Lord had showed me through scripture. That person, that latter person today is completely delivered, completely delivered. Like, and the, the, the email that this person wrote then was just like, thank you for that word. I, I believe that. I've asked the Lord to take this for years and he hasn't. Maybe that's just my thorn to bear. Uh, but, uh, but thank you for this. And I, I believe that and I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on this. And they did and they're delivered. The other person is still blessed, but they're still having some real challenges. Same word. Same set of challenges, two different responses. Somebody was craving, craving, desiring to be out of a position that they were in. And they applied and they worked and it wasn't easy, but delivered. And God is, he's, this, the Bible says he's no respecter of persons. It doesn't mean he doesn't respect you. It just means that what he'll do for me, he'll do for you. He'll do for anybody. But when we can get to that place and really focus on what he says and just start with the little, you know, you may think, well, gosh, I prayed and I asked and nothing really happened. Well, Jesus didn't speak to the tree and walk a few steps and turn around and start yelling at it again. And I said... And then walk away and then turn back and look. In fact, Scripture says that he didn't even, wasn't even looking for it. It was other people that saw it. He just said it, walked away. It's kind of like the drop the mic. But you're like, well, that was Jesus. Did you know the Scripture says that as he is, so are you in this world? And this is where he's wanting to get you, to a place where you get revelation to pull out some of these thorns of anxiety in your life, to start asking out of a place of revelation and not just knowledge and information that he can do it, but because you've meditated. And this is why he says, if you abide in me, my word abides in you. If we, if we are mutually connected, you're going to start asking because you know that I love you. You know that I want to do this for you. You know that I'm willing to do this. And when you start making that promise so big, you start, you're pointing your mind at the promise and not at the problem. It's going to become bigger and it's going to get inside you. And then start praising the Lord and thanking that it's already done. And then out of that place, release your faith. Thank you, Lord, that this is already done. And you just stay there. and Don't go back and dig up your seed and look at the tree that you spoke to. Just go about your business and keep working one victory at a time. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Isn't it funny? I say, I'll finish up with this, and it's like 10 more minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. We're going to honor the Lord right now, because according to his word, it says to honor the Lord with your possessions, with the first fruits of your increase. God is a fruity God. <laughs> he always wants you to bear fruit, but it comes from a root. And if you have the the, the heart and the root of love that God will do this thing for you. This is, as I share almost every Sunday, one of the most powerful things that we can absolutely do is sow into the kingdom of God. And when we do it out of a place of revelation, not just information, because all churches want your money, you know, get that pastor a plane, you can get him a new car. I don't need a plane. But when you do it, not out of what you've been taught, but out of a heart, because God says, I, I can take a seed that you sow and and it's going to cover you. I'm going to do some work on your behalf against the enemy, but I'm also going to increase from that seed. And I'm going to increase you. And when you start to do it from that heart and point your faith towards that, not just doing it because it's right, but doing it out of joy, whoo, that's that place where you start asking out of revelation. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we praise you right now and we honor you. What an honor. You're worthy to be praised. We thank you that we have this opportunity to sow from our heart and that it is attached to a massive and a powerful promise that you shall rebuke the devourer for our sake, that he shall not devour the fruit of our ground. That is our house. That is our children. That is our, that is our family. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're working on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen.